do you believe that the Belgian Confession still speaks, that it's still a faithful representative, uh, representation of the teachings of Scripture, but also theologically and pastorally vital for the church? Well, here, here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would, I would definitely say so. Welcome back to Roundtable, a podcast produced by Mid-America Reform Seminary. This is episode 53, and I'm Jared Luchibor. Thank you for joining us. Well, if you've been in the Reformed camp long enough, the month of October should ring a bell for you. Not because of witches and ghouls and pumpkin carving, but something that holds much more significance for our lives as Christians, Protestant and Reformed Christians specifically, and that's the season of Reformation, beginning with the epochal work of Martin Luther and his nailing of the 95 Theses on the church doors of Wittenberg in response to the selling of indulgences by the Catholic Church. Of course, as we know, it didn't end there. The Reformation continued, and a variety of documents were written reflecting the theological confessions of the Reformers. Reverend Mark Vanderhart, Dr. Cornelis Venema, and Dr. J. Mark Beach, three of our Reformed professors, sit down to discuss a selection of these documents known as the Three Forms of Unity, beginning with the earliest of these, the Belgic Confession. We're going to begin with a discussion of the Belgian Confession. Now, what is uh, the purpose of confessions in the life of a Protestant church? Maybe we should talk about that before we look at the specifics of the Belgic. Well, the confessions serve a variety of purposes. It's interesting that in the tradition that holds to the Belgic, the Heidelberg Catechism, and the Canons of Dort, we call them forms of unity because they give expression unitedly by the churches of the, of the word of the gospel, their understanding of the Christian faith, its teaching, the teaching of the word of God. And the confessions are, they're not a, an afterthought. I think it's very significant that uh, Carl Truman, who writes a rather interesting book on the creeds and confessions, he entitles the book, The Creedal Imperative. It's impossible to hear the Word of God, read the Word of God, appropriate the Word of God without responding to it by way of a confession, a saying together with others, unitedly, what we believe the Word of God to teach. Before the Belgian Confession was written, and we'll get into the specifics of that, there were already Protestant confessions uh, that had been written. Were there not? Well, there's a whole history uh, prior to the Belgian Confession of confessions uh, finding uh, expression, some of which, many of which were of a very local nature and served the churches in a given city state or a smaller geographic area. And then over time, some of these uh, certainly gained greater popularity. But Luther and Zwingli both had produced their own confessional statements, uh, catechetical style statements that uh, served the churches. And so when the Belgic Confession came along, it was, again, addressing particular needs of churches within a given geographic area uh, and trying to uh, give expression to the faith in a manner that would show that what the Protestants were after what after wasn't heresy, wasn't something that stood against the ecumenical creeds, wasn't something that was novel and innovative in that sense, but rather they wanted to give expression to a living faith that uh, resonated with the history of Christendom, particularly the ancient church and the Bible, the gospel itself is, is presented in the Bible. And uh, often they had to give expression to faith, not only to help serve the churches in which they were trying to teach and educate the laity, but to offer a kind of defense that what they taught was from the Bible and in accord with historic Christian teaching. 
The Belgian Confession was authored by a man, Guido de Bray. It's sometimes uh, uh, thought to be modeled after the French or the Gallican Confession of Calvin. And uh, the, the year of its being authored was in 1561. But what were the historical circumstances that pressed upon Guido de Bray to write this confession? What can we say about that? Well, this is um, Cornell. I would, I would say of the three confessional standards of the churches on the continent, especially the Dutch churches, this one was produced in perhaps the most difficult circumstance in terms of ecclesiastical and civil relationships among the city-states, nation-states in Europe. It, it definitely has a lineage. Uh, Guido de Bray had studied under Calvin in Geneva. He was familiar with Calvin, apparently wrote a draft that became the basis for the Gallican Confession in 1559. And the Belgic Confession, just two years later, is very similar. It's not surprising. He's not only a student of Calvin, but also a French Reform Huguenot minister. And if you read the preface to the Belgic Confession, what... Uh, Mark said, Mark Beach, becomes very apparent their intention, Guido's intention was to say, what we are confessing and what we believe is in line with and uh, consistent with the historic Christian church's confession, the Catholic Christian faith. And there's a particular accent in the Belgic where there's a bit of an apology or a defense of the Reformed faith over against the allegation or suggestion among Roman Catholic opponents that the reformers were undermining the civil magistrate and that they would, if their position prevail, they would bring about a kind of anarchy and chaos in the societies and countries of Western Europe. So you get very strong language in the Belgic, on the one hand, defending what is represented as the historic Christian faith, or the articles, as it's put at one point, of the Christian religion, nothing new, nothing out of the ordinary, firmly rooted, solidly based upon what the church has, has believed throughout the centuries and what is taught in Scripture, but uh, an interest to disassociate or distinguish uh, the Reformed faith from the more radical wing of the Reformation. So do you is it fair to say that the Belgian Confession represents kind of uh, Calvin's middle road? Not, I don't mean compromising or weak, but sort of a we're not we're not in Rome's camp, but we're not in the Anabaptist camp, and kind of an apologetic uh, edge to its wording and its concerns. Yeah, it, it's actually trying to be winsome in its presentation, and uh, the goal is to win a voice for the the Protestants in the French-speaking Belgic lands. Mm. And, uh, yeah, very much modeled after Calvin's earlier confession, the French confession, and very reflective, really, as a whole, of Calvin's theological emphases and ways of teaching in that sense, the Belgic, um, along with the French Confession, would come closest to giving you a sense of uh, Calvin's thought itself. It, it's very near unto that. But, yeah, the goal to show the Roman Catholic governing authorities were not a threat to good governance, but we will obey the government and all things lawful. But, you know, he appended those words that are rather famous, now we offer that they, the Protestants, would offer their backs to the stripes, their tongues to knives, their mouths to gags, their whole body to the fire, rather than deny the truth expressed in this confession. So uh, the game, they'd really up the ante in terms of theological debate in those days. I mean, you could literally lose your life, lose your tongue, lose your, your living, all kinds of things. So it was very bold for him to compose this confession. And the Roman Catholic authorities uh, weren't persuaded. They, uh, many Protestants did suffer persecution. I think there's only two surviving 
copies of the original uh, Belgic Confession. Uh, hmm. So it's a different, what it is to confess the faith back then, um, we, we don't really quite grasp what was at stake today. In fact, Debray himself uh, died as a martyr. Indeed. Executed. Uh, I don't know the particulars of that, that uh, because I know Spain was was at war with the several uh, lowland provinces, and and um, Debray was arrested and eventually, I believe, hanged because of his uh, Protestant uh, convictions. How is the Belgian Confession laid out? I mean, is it is it sort of uh, the several articles arranged in kind of a systematic theological way? Uh, I would say that, um, well, before I answer that question, I do want to make this observation about the Belgic. It's probably the most international consensus statements of the Reformed faith that you'll find. Uh, unfortunately, in the uh, Dutch Reformed tradition, it became known as the Netherlands Confession which sort of uh, camouflages the fact that it was written by a French Reformed pastor and was by the Senate of Dort, just to tie in with the third of the three forms that we're going to talk about, was actually by the Senate of Dort, which was the most international and Catholic mm -hmm. of the Reformed assemblies that wrote confessions in the 16th and 17th centuries, um, declared to be an answer to one of the French delegates who was unable to come, who wanted mm -hmm. the Senate to produce a reform statement of faith for all the reformed churches throughout Europe, the Senate of Dort said, well, we already have such a confession. It's the Belgic. Uh, it's, I think, why Philip Schaff says it's probably the most remarkable of all of the reformed confessional documents in the 16th century. But as to the layout of the confession, unlike the Heidelberg, it spends a bit of time at the beginning in the first seven articles dealing with the question of how, how do we know God, who he is, his works, the gospel, and it lays out a doctrine of revelation, general and special. It has several articles dealing with the, uh, the doctrine of scripture, the canon, its inspiration, its uh, supremacy over even church assemblies and other documents. Well, that, that's an interesting feature of the uh, Belgic because it means the uh, Belgic confession itself recognizes that it's a subordinate standard. It aims only to summarize what we first find in Scripture. Then it follows um, a fairly traditional order dealing with uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, mm -hmm. the um, three persons mm -hmm. and their respective works, doctrine of election, mm -hmm. then the work of Christ as mediator, as person and work. And then a number of articles dealing with the, uh, the work of the Spirit through and within the church as a very high view of the church, as did Calvin, outside of which there is no, it doesn't even add that slippery adjective, ordinary. It says outside of which there is no uh, salvation. And then in the last articles dealing with means of grace, preaching, sacraments, and a particularly significant article on the... Um, civil magistrate and its responsibility in distinction from that of the church. Um, it, it follows, in other words, fairly closely the, uh, the outline of the Apostles' Creed as a Trinitarian structure, mm -hmm. um, and it follows the sequence of topics even that you might consider the ordinary sequence in, in doctrinal studies. Perhaps one area where it's a bit unique in, in terms of diverting from a typical sequence is it treats uh, creation and fall of man after which comes its article on uh, eternal election. Mm -hmm. After that, then, the next article, Article 17, the recovery of fallen man. So its placement mm -hmm. and handling of election is interesting, and then comes a discussion of incarnation and Christ's due nature. So its uh, placement of uh, predestination, uh, election, is very much ordered for a right order of teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, because it's, it's placed, the doctrine of election is placed where it is, it has a very implicit 
to speak anachronistically, uh, infralapsarian sort of orientation, in that it's out of the fallen human race, the ruined man, um, that the prosperity of Adam being thus fallen into perdition, God manifested, if you will, his eternal decision to us as uh, merciful and just. The, the placement's interesting. Uh, it's not really addressing those later debates, but you can see its sensitivity mm -hmm. in uh, trying to take away a certain degree of speculation relative to that, that particular article, doctrine. Okay. What does this... Of all the three forms of unity, I suspect that the Belgian Confession has the most elaborate or lengthy statements on the doctrine of Scripture. Is there anything in the Belgian Confession's wording that stands out or that's been especially directive for uh, Reformed churches in terms of Scripture? Well, the Heidelberg itself doesn't um, have a formal set of questions and answers on the doctrine of Scripture which some would regard as a weakness. And of course, that's not in the purview of the canon. So in the three forms of unity, this is the confessional document that takes that up. And um, I, I don't think there's anything particularly unique in what it does, except that it is fairly expansive. I think uh, Articles 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, 7... Um, all to take up different aspects of the doctrine of Scripture and special revelation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the doctrine of, of revelation, it's very Calvinian. For example, the statement on the authentication of the Scriptures as the Word of God, it's, it reflects Calvin's position quite closely. It does have an interesting article on the Apocrypha, Article 6, which is a little different accent than the Westminster Confession in its first chapter, which takes a fairly strong and rather um, dismal view of any possible use of the uh, apocryphal writings. It allows for, not as canonical, but as of some value and helpfulness in uh, the instruction of the church, the reading and uh, use of those apocryphal writings. I actually remember when I was a seminarian, uh, one of my professors, Dr. Banster, wrote this essay for the Christian Reformed Church's magazine, The Banner, in which he uh, pointed that out and made something of it. I'm not sure how much you can make of it, uh, but it, it's one feature, and I'm not really sure what the background of that is, why that is included. Clearly, on the Reformation position that the apocrypha don't belong to the canon, it's it's classically Protestant. Yeah, and, and um, to reiterate something uh, Dr. Venema alluded to, they're very Calvinian, and why do you believe them? Why do you trust them as word of God, count them as such? And in Article 5, uh, well, certainly the church gives testimony and such, but we especially believe in them because the Holy Spirit witnesses in our hearts that they are from God. That's a very strong uh, Calvin emphasis. If I may add one other thing I would like to get in here on the Belgic, and that is it has a very strong, very Calvinian affirmation of the presence of Christ in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. So much so that I can tell you a story. When I graduated from a reform seminary that should go unnamed, I was asked, "Where, what view of the sacrament and of Christ's presence does this represent? And the professor in question read from the Belgic without identifying his source. Well, I must have been a Zwinglian at that point in my life because I, I said, I think that's Roman Catholic. <laughs> well, actually, it's reformed and biblical. Um, whatever you think of the way it's articulated, uh, the Belgic is very much consistent with the Reformed confessions generally convinced that the sacraments are not a, uh, a sort of an afterthought in terms of the way Christ is present and communicates himself to his people with the word and, of course, only in the context of the ministry of the word, which comes before uh, 
uh, the sacraments are very strongly affirmed and uh, the language employed is strong in terms of their efficacy. That's actually, uh, I think, the Belgic's handling of the sacraments and more specifically the Lord's Supper is among the best confessional writings giving expression to this doctrine among any of the confessions, in my opinion. And I've always thought uh, the church would be well served if if in uh, our worship forms and our formulary used for uh, reception of the sacrament and partaking of communion, if we would adopt more of the language straight out of the Belgic Confession. Um, once again, it has this very potent Calvin emphasis and manner of expression. So, I mean, if you find Calvin's doctrine of Christ's presence a mystery, mystical, I can't put it all together, will Calvin be the first to say, that's right, <laughs> you can't put it all together? But is it, its biblical manner, I think, is something that, since we tend in our tradition to be a bit more Zwinglian, and mere memorialists, or we try to self-manufacture an identity with Christ through private meditation right. or something. I think the Belgic's a really great remedy to those propensities in, in our uh, church tradition. Because it seems to me, uh, in my reading of Calvin, that he would say, by faith we have a real communion with Christ's virtutes, his powers, his virtues, even in a physical sense. But if you pressed him, I'll explain how that is true. He's, I, I can't explain the mystery. Well, he's not afraid, you know. We're, we do not err, says the yeah. not only Calvin, but uh, the Belgic. We do not err uh, when we say that what is eaten and drunk by us is the proper natural body and the proper blood of Christ. Right. Uh, but the manner of our partaking of the same is not by the mouth, but by the Spirit through faith. But the point is, is there is somehow this mystical identity and unity, communion with and of the natural body and, and proper blood of Christ. So in conclusion for our discussion, the uh, do you believe that the Belgian Confession still speaks, that it's still a faithful representative, uh, representation of the teachings of Scripture, but also theologically and pastorally vital for the church? Well, hear, hear. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would, I would definitely say so, and I would uh, quote the words of Yaroslav Pelikan. If traditionalism is the dead faith of the living, tradition, and in this case, what we've received in the Belgic Confession as part of our confessional tradition is the living faith of the dead. Now, that requires the church to appropriate and make a proper use of the Belgic Confession. Like any confession, it has its limitations. It has to be read in its context as a confession that was first written in the 16th century, but it, it's the living faith of the dead, I truly believe. Okay. And it, it was a church that it's it's finally not the work of a single author. It was mildly revised and embraced at the Synod of Dort. And um, as such, it was also commissioned there to be translated into the Dutch tongue and the Latin tongue. Although the French text remains, in my view, the definitive authoritative text, the Latin text was never officially approved at the Synod of Dort. It was commissioned, but the Synod deceased and uh, had, had dispersed before uh, that came back for their approval. But nonetheless, we're always uh, going to be a true student of the document. You go to the French text, you can look at the Dutch translation, you can look at the Latin text as well. And you know, like any confessional document, it's a living document for us, but to use it well, we need to read and hear it in its, its original historical context and, and how theological ideas were understood and used back when. 
Some excellent insight there on the Belgic Confession. Next stop on the tour de force of the three forms, we encounter the Heidelberg Catechism, a confessional document familiar to a lot of those in tune with Reformed theology, most notably its first question and answer, what is your only comfort in life and in death? Stay tuned as our professors explore that next week. For more podcast episodes, you can find us on our website at midamerica.edu, YouTube, and wherever you happen to listen to your favorite podcasts, be sure to search Mid-America Reform Seminaries Roundtable. I'm Jared Luchibor. Till next time.